a fantastic uh, nail talk from Dr. Um, Jelinek. So, you know, I have to go back and say that the MEM, so the medical education meeting is certainly one of the reasons why I joined AP Derm. So Dr. Goose began this tradition of creating this academic-like atmosphere at AP Derm um, when he first started the practice where we come uh, together to talk about clinical cases and to also learn about any updates in the company. So things that will affect your practice. And the meeting, meeting has certainly, it, evolved as our practice has evolved as we've all come together and, and um, joined to, to become AP Derm and um, what we are today. And um, the latest uh, evolution is that we actually can get CME credits for this meeting. So we're certainly learning a lot, not just in terms of the clinical knowledge and, and um, our, um, our company, but we're, we're learning about how we can best make the medical education meeting uh, serve you all, and it's really for the pr providers because this is um, a company that is run by the physicians and um, the pr pr providers. So with that said, I'm very excited to introduce um, Dr. Jelinek for uh, this CME presentation on me me melanonychia. So nail disorders often generate pretty much um, uh, uncertainty in clinical care. We've all seen it. You see a lesion, you think it's probably a bit benign, but you don't want to rest your, um, uh, your, your bets on it. And we are lucky uh, at AP Durham to have Nat, who's an international expert on nails, to share his pearls with us. So he's, he's also certainly one of those inspirational folks who does what he loves, and we can all see it. So he graduated from Brown and UMass School of Med. Uh, he completed a Durham re residency at UMass, followed by a fellowship in Mohs and Nail d Diseases under Mary Maloney, who many of us know from all the talks and um, papers that we've seen. D Dr. Jelinek is very experienced in skin cancer and re reconstructive um, surgery. Um, and he's also, as you all know, a national expert in nails. He's board certified in dermatology. He's a fellow at the AED and the Mohs College and has served on the board of directors of the Mohs College. He was fellowship director for a Mohs fellowship for 10 years, and he's the current president of the Council of Nail D Disorders. He has served as an associate editor for JAD and is an author on a lot of scientific papers. I mean, if you just type his name in PubMed, you're definitely gonna go a bit beyond uh, a few pages. Um, he has written book chapters and has le lectured nationally and internationally. Um, he recently finished a work as um, an editor and the author of the fourth edition of the, the pr premier nails book that we all use, which is Cher and D Daniel's Nails. So we are very, very lucky to have Nat speak to us today. And on a personal note, he knows this, um, that I am indebted to him for helping me to na navigate a pretty d difficult nails case. And I can see with pleasure that um, everyone is well and the patient was very happy to have him involved. Mm. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Nat. Great, thank you. Thank you, everybody. So we're like a little over, um, I think it was about a year since uh, we lectured last uh, and it was, it's been quite a year. So this is great to get back together, but I really look forward to doing this in person. Um, I'm getting sick of talking in front of my computer, so I'll do my best to keep it lively. I'm gonna share my screen now and pull up that lecture for everybody. Okay, get that and start that. <clears throat> All right. So thank you for the invitation. This is an honor. This is a, a great uh, tradition that Sam started and has been upheld and um, expanded. And I think it sets the bar for what we can do <clears throat> as a private institution um, outside of the official academic realm. And it's, uh, it's really a terrific activity. So uh, thank you. All right. My favorite topic in medicine is melanonychia. I could, I could talk about this for hours. And uh, that would, if you have insomnia, call me and we'll get through that. So I'm going to try to distill it down to five teaching points with lo actually lots and lots and lots of pictures to hammer home certain messages. So we will get into it. This is my big conflict of interest. This is the book. Uh, there I am. There's a great chapter that I didn't write that is outstanding by Eckhart Haneke on melanonychia. 
so that is my conflict of interest, but no others, no off-label drugs. These are all my own cases unless I reference them otherwise, and they've all been by the same, read by the same two or three dermatopathologists. And so this is what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna look beyond the nail. We're gonna learn how to use our dermatoscope. A big point is know when you don't know. I'm gonna harp on that. We're not gonna wimp out. Um, and we're gonna learn why our dermatopathology colleagues are so important. And then we're not gonna amputate unless you have to. So here are the ground rules for the words I'm gonna use. <clears throat> when I say activation, it means that if you do a melanocyte stain, there is no proliferation of matrix melanocytes, it's a freckle or an ephelid. A lentigo is gonna be a single cell benign proliferation, a nevus, a nested proliferation. Sometimes the difference between those is very subtle. So those can almost be lumped in many instances. And then a melanoma is obviously malignant proliferation. All right, first rule, you're gonna look beyond the nail. So the person comes in top left or this picture and you really have to look at the rest of their nails and certain other key parts of their body. So here all of a sudden we see other nails with pigmented bands. We see the arrows pointing to pigmented macules in the oral mucosa. Another example, a person comes in pigmented band. Now we look at her toes, it turns out she's got lighter but other pigmented bands on her right big toe, left second toe and her lip is full of oral labial um, melanocytic macules. Another person comes in, this is the index target nail, very concerned about that. You start looking around, boy, this person has everything, right? They got uh, longitudinal melanotic and multiple nails on fingertips on the lower uh, mucosa. Another patient, this is uh, even more recent, one target nail. This is the chief complaint, rule out melanoma. But then if you look at her oral uh, mucosa and her little toenail, she also has pigment there. And all of these come together to form the diagnosis of laugier hunsaker syndrome. I think I see a couple a month, and there's referral bias there, but you'll see it at least once a year if you look. There's an old saying, the eye cannot see what the mind does not know, that a pathologist taught me in medical school. So it's up to us. You know, if you don't know it, who's going to know it? I mean, thankfully, we have a lot of subspecialty in our group, and I love to see these patients, so send them all. And uh, Julia Baltz, also in our group, runs a nail clinic at UMass, uh, so, so that's a great reference, too. Um, uh, this is the classic triad of melanonechia, oral, and genital pigment, but it has been expanded to include ocular pigment. And I did not show pictures, but that's frequent, and palmo plantar pigment. And they don't have to have all five or all three. They can actually just have one and it becomes almost a diagnosis of exclusion. But uh, this is an important one to know. All right, look beyond the nail. Someone comes in, index nail, rule out melanoma, but then you look at his shin and his face. This is minocycline pigment. We're dermatologists. We're expected to know all of this. Another person comes in, multiple pigmented lesions. This is the first of a teaching point that's going to hold through for the next 45 minutes. Multiple nails is generally reassuring. And so you're going to look for a trigger. And in this instance, the person had recently gotten cyclophosphamide, so medication-induced melanonychia, very common. This person comes in, multiple pigmented uh, bands, but they also have other changes. You see the nail plate atrophy, nail bed hypertrophy, onychorexics, um, and this is lichen planus. This is the same diagnosis, lighter skin, also melanonychia. Um, this is classic lichen planus, onychorexics, nail plate atrophy almost coilonychia, uh, onychoschisia, and melanonychia, along with erythronychia. So if you remember back last year's lecture, erythronychia, we had localized on one digit, polydactylus on multiple digits. This would be polydactylus, longitudinal erythronychia, or what David DeBerker calls generalized. So we have only a few diagnoses there, but put it all together, this is like in plainness there. So look beyond the nail. Multiple nails is usually reassuring. We're going to look at the other nails, skin, mucosa, medications, past medical history. Pregnancy is a fairly common cause. Uh, do a review, to review of systems. Addison's disease can cause this. Uh, I've never once seen a case of poitz jaegers syndromes, but it's, it's there. If you hear my cat scratching at my door behind me, I'm, I'm trying to ignore that. All right. The pleasures of being at home. Use your dermatoscope. Uh, we all have them. Learn to love your dermatoscope. And this can be a non-invasive test where you just put it on the nail plate. And the key features here is if you see a brown background on the bottom right, 
with irregular brown lines, any irregularity that is strongly associated with melanoma. This is a study based on over 140 patients, um, sequentially seen, photographed, and biopsied. And this was their conclusions back in 2002. So here's an obvious one, right? It screams melanoma from the door, brown background, irregular brown lines in terms of their spacing, diameter, parallelism. You get pigment dropout focally. Um, and so this is pretty slam dunk for a melanoma without dermoscopy, but dermoscopy highlights those changes. And a more subtle example, same diagnosis, also melanoma in situ. Imagine that that streak, the background of it, is a canvas that you're painting on, and that canvas is in the tan brown spectrum. And then on it, you're painting with the brown, black, tan uh, palette. And so this shows more subtle irregularity, but irregularity nonetheless. Another example, pigment dropout, big warning sign. We see that white uh, stripe. And then you see the arrow pointing to the micro Hutchinson sign. And that's again, strongly associated with melanoma. This example, okay, now just focus on the line on the left. Just focusing on the line, you can see that it's a brown background with brown lines and they're slightly irregular, right? More prominent towards the midline or towards the right of the screen, uh, less towards the outside. And this is an older person, nail matrix nevus, moderate to severe atypia. Just as on the skin, adults have no reason to be making pigmented lesions on the nail with moderate to severe atypia as adults. This is something we see in kids, not in adults. All right, now we're moving from sort of more proliferative, slightly less pro pro proliferative. This is a lentigo, but I wanna point out how this is slightly wider at the base. And as it goes towards the tip of the digit, it's narrower. That's the triangle sign, which means it's proliferated in the time it took from nail, the formation of that nail to grow out. So it's an actively proliferative lesion. This was banal histopathologically and was a lentigo. But look at that nevus. I mean, I can't tell the difference between them. Both brown background, irregular brown lines. All right, this is helpful though. A gray background, maybe a line or two. Sometimes you hardly see anything with a dermatoscope. This is really good for melanocytic activation or a freckle. So if you see that gray nothing, that's very, very reassuring. But this is also melanocytic activation, right? Brown background, a few lines in there. You, know, you put them next to the lentigo, the nevus with moderate to severe tipping the adult. I mean, they're all basically kissing cousins at this point. All right, so those are all melanocytic etiologies. There are non-melanocytic etiologies, right? You can have blood, splinter hemorrhage can grow out actually as a sublingual hematoma. Um, as longitudinal melanonychia, you can have fungal infections present as melanonychia, bacterial processes. Um, and even silver nitrate in this instance, uh, which was used to chemically cauterize a pyogenic granuloma. The most common benign diagnosis I get for melanonychia is subungual hemorrhage. And it is so classic, it has its own ICD-10 code. So if you put, type in hematoma in EMMA, subungual hematoma comes up with both a fingernail and a toenail code. And as opposed to that longitudinal process where we had a brown background and, and brown lines that someone would be painting on, you imagine sort of longitudinally painting, hematomas look like someone just threw paint at the nail. So it doesn't, excuse me, have that longitudinal process. It looks more disorganized. You have this sort of filamentous distal shape. You can see this in all of these. Unfortunately, my arrow is not working now, but you can see where the blood is growing into the tongue and groove pattern of the nail bed. And it doesn't have that brown background, irregular brown lines uh, shape. Again, fairly classic. Once you see it, you just know it. Now, this is interesting because this is truly longitudinal. When I saw it, you see the clear nail proximal to it. That's an important point because the hemorrhage is gone. It's getting pushed out with the nail bed. And you can prove that there's normal nail behind it. It's not a melanoma. So why did they send this person? Well, if you look at the initial consult pictures, you can see that it's just present there. And it's very hard to tell in that picture whether that's melanin or blood, but as it grown out, it's much more obvious. And this just shows one example from a colleague, one of my old fellows who actually shows true melanonychia. I've never seen this presenting just in the proximal nail. And it looks very much like that picture on the left. Now, everyone should see a cat here, right? Everyone in the, at the home sees a cat. How can you not see a cat? This was a veterinarian who specialized in cats who also had a cat tattoo. Like unbelievable 
that I caught it at this moment in time. Now, if you know me, I'm really into cats. So we actually got this published as um, a cute little paper. And, you know, of all the papers I've published, the cute, silly ones are my favorite ones. This is like one of my favorite papers ever. I think it's adorable. Um, so uh, anyway, it's cute, hard to believe. All right, so we've got our dermatoscope. We've got our rules. We're gonna look all over. We're dermatologists. We're gonna think about all this stuff. Now we're gonna know when we don't know. All right, what about this one? Brown background. It's irregular brown lines, right? It, it's in that paper, this is a melanoma. This is a melanoma in situ. Okay, we'll go with that. Very similar. This is a nevus, no atypia. Put them together, I can't tell the difference. Okay, brown backgrounds, irregular brown lines all over the place, melanoma in situ. Smudgy, gross pigment, erythema. This is a lentigo. Okay, I already showed this picture, this woman. She was 18 at the time, she was a URI student and her mom was a nurse who watched Dr. Oz, who featured this apparently. And uh, she insisted he be she be seen, her daughter. This was melanoma in situ. Incidentally, most people's diagnostic, uh, differential diagnosis begins and ends with onychomycosis. So this was diagnosed by the pediatrician as onychomycosis. Um, they just don't know about it. It's not a criticism. This is why we have to learn it. Uh, but the mom was like, no, this needs to be biopsied, and she was right. All right, this is uh, quite a recent case. This is pregnancy associated. Just remember that pregnancy can associate. You can also have melanomas. It doesn't get her off the hook, but this is uh, benign activation. Uh, this is in a 12 year old and really funky. The dermatoscope on the right shows you can see the brown background there, but really weird atypical lines. This is a lentigo. And a theme that's gonna come up is generally speaking, the younger the person is, the more likely it's benign. The older the person is, the more likely it's malignant. And puberty seems to be the cutoff there. All right, this is a dentist. This is his left index finger. He just started playing guitar when this appeared. It's his fret finger. He's convinced it's from friction. He's also like a distant cousin of Robert Baron, who's one of the nail greats. And just based on that, the history, one nail, it seemed funny, but it doesn't look that bad, right? But if you look at his fingertip, look at the hypernychium and distal tip skin, pigment all over the place. This is Hutchinson sign, right? True Hutchinson sign is radial growth phase melanoma into the periungual tissues. You can have pigment in the periungual tissues, which is not radial growth phase, that's a pseudo Hutchinson sign, but this is a true Hutchinson sign. And when we did the biopsy, look at the triangle in the matrix. Another key point, something that's triangular, and here you see it triangular mostly in the matrix. So it's growing in that period there. This is a melanoma in situ. All right, toe, activation, surprising. I was totally surprised. You know when you don't know. I don't know, looking at that, I can't tell. How about this? This hadn't even grown out yet to the free edge. This is activation, so no proliferation. How about this one? Lentigo, mild atypia. Oop, let me go back, sorry. That was lentigo mild atypia. This one's nevus moderate atypia. So we put them together, activation, lentigo, and nevus with moderate atypia, all less than a millimeter wide. Very tricky. So we have another one. That's activation. How about this one? That's a nevus. So less than a millimeter doesn't get you off the hook. Okay, local police officer. You know, a little smudgy looking, maybe a little periungual pigment on the cuticle on the top right. It's a thumb, one of the most common digits to get nail melanoma, thumb, then big toe, then everything else. So sort of pound for pound, you're more concerned with those digits. And his wife sitting in the chair said, you're going to get a biopsy to him. This is back in the day when you could have significant others sitting in chairs in your rooms. And I use the joke that, you know, what's the definition of a minor surgical procedure? It's something done on someone other than yourself. Like she could say that sitting in the chair, but he's the one having to go through it. She was right. It was a melanoma in situ. That's him. Graft, he, he cuts it when he trains with his gun. Okay. This looks funny. It's actually onychomycosis inactivation, probably activation triggered by onychomycosis. Here's fungal melanonychia. Great paper on that. If you want to go deep, Robert Baron's paper on this is outstanding. And I guess the teaching point beside it looking different is that it's more refractory to treatment than non-fungal, non-pigmented um, uh, fungal infections. All right, 20-something-year-old melanoma. 
Weird looking, right? With the pigment dropout and then the band on the other side. Pigment dropout, a big warning sign. This is activation. It's got that gray look to it, but it definitely has lines. And look at it there. There's a real lesion there, but activation. This is a recent case, and this really troubled me because this is a nevus with moderate atypia and epithelioid features. And it just didn't look like much. Know when you don't know. You don't know in a lot of these. This is the pregnancy associated activation. They look the same to me. All right, big toe, periungal pigment on the cuticle. That's melanoma in situ all days, right? Yes, it is. All right, and this is an 80 year old guy, big toe, remember thumb and big toe, brown background, irregular brown lines. I'm basically counseling him on melanoma, you know, during the biopsy. This was lens ago, no atypia. Like, where? How bad am I at this? Nine years old at the time. I was the third or fourth person he's seen. Lovely, but extremely high maintenance family. And I convinced them that I, I needed to biopsy this. This is a melanoma in situ. It got seen by three separate pathologists. The third, who, who David Silvers in, in New York, um, said something like, in spite of the age of the patient, this can only be melanoma in situ. So remember, younger, more likely to be benign, but this was not. And neither were any of these. So, all right, we're, we'll get there. We'll, we'll find it. Uh, teenager somewhere, very difficult family, uh, melanoma in situ. Early 20s, college student, Lentigo. Real lesion intraoperatively. You can see it right there in the matrix. Okay, this is Jamaican-American. Spouse of a family practice doctor, multiple bands on other digits, but the big toe was darker. And something my spidey sense said that's not right. Intraoperatively, you can see how smudged it is in the inset picture, melanoma in situ. All right, now everyone has seen this picture before. You see the micro Hutchinson sign, the pigment dropout. We should all be screaming from the rafters, melanoma, melanoma in situ. Yes, melanoma. You're all right. How about this? Target nail looks weird and bad but multiple nails involved. Remember, multiple nails, more likely to be benign. This is just um, ethnic pigment. Okay, I, I, if I was there, I'd ask you to scream out hemorrhage, right? This is not a longitudinal process. This is someone who threw pigment at the nail. That's a sublingual hematoma. You can see normal nail growing in behind it. Subtle, but real, right? You can see a brown background, irregular brown lines, and that smudgy red line on the dermatoscope in the middle, melanoma in situ. Also melanoma in situ, also melanoma in situ. Let's put them together. You sort of have subtle, pretty obvious, smack you in the face obvious from left to right. They're all melanoma in situ. Under the microscope, they all look the same. Okay, age matters. This is 16 years old. This girl came up from Virginia. This is a nevus with severe atypia. And it's so difficult, these are that if this was on me or one of my parents, they would say this is indistinguishable from melanoma. It's so severely atypical, but in kids, these are almost always benign, very hard for pathologists. This is nevus with severe atypia. And so is this. They're actually the same under the microscope, but, and this is also a teenager. And incidentally, uh, she was like borderline from melanoma. My, my aunt in New Bedford, Apparently, I was rereading like a February newspaper, just sent me the newspaper clipping last week, which had a whole article about this high school swimmer and her nail of borderline melanoma. They misquote me in that. This is very recent, lent to go, okay? But, and, and it's real, look at it right there. But compare those two. The one on the right is Nevis, severe atypia. The one on the left is lent to go. You know, we know that we don't know a lot, okay? Uh, college graduate student, melanoma in situ. This shows him before his hemi on block excision afterwards. Uh, recent case, nevus with epithelioid features. I was really concerned about this case. There's intraoperative dermoscopy in the top right. And then there's dermoscopy actually on the specimen. And look how irregular and smudged it is. There's a whole literature on that I don't want to get into. It's all invasive at that point. So it doesn't help us really diagnose people. You're, you're already going to do the biopsy at that point. Um, and I wrote a commentary for Archives Dermatology basically saying, when all is said and done, if you perform intraoperative dermoscopy when you're 90% of the way there, you know, what's, what's the point? 
but it's fun. You know, medicine should be fun. All right, we'll get there. This is neighbor of a dermatologist. <laughs> oh, you know, there's a baby in the picture and the dermatologist sends me this picture. This guy's leaving in a week or a week and a half for Antarctica for like months. What do you think about this? It'd been there since childhood, incidentally. So I see him in the office. This is what it looks like. Okay, brown background, irregular brown lines. Everyone should think we can't say that's not a melanoma. It has all the melanoma signs, right? It was a melanoma site too. That's his intraoperative picture. That's his telemedicine follow-up picture doing well. All right, this looks different, right? This looks like someone painted it on there. It's not, it's actually a uh, fungal melanonychia, but it doesn't have that longitudinal process, right? That everyone should see uh, and associate now with these primary melanocytic lesions. And you can also see superficial white on the uh, big toe as well. Zoomed up, pretty view of that. All right, now here are some challenging cases. This is from the U uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock healthcare system. This guy, veteran, He's had four biopsies over the past 10 years. And the best we could get was that they said predominantly antigenous melanocytic hyperplasia with mild atypia. And he describes the pain that he went through to get that diagnosis. So I look at him and we see irregular brown lines on Dermosk. We see brown you know, pigment on the periungual tissues. Periungual pigment is really abnormal. Doesn't mean it's melanoma, but it's definitely abnormal. And so we just went, we think this is melanoma until proven otherwise. We biopsied basically all these different spots. And that's just a copy of the pathology report. The punchline is this is evolving melanoma in situ. Uh, that's his intraoperative picture and healed, uh, especially in Mediterranean or darker skin types, the grafts will often hyperpigment. Another recent and very challenging case. This is a guy who had a biopsy many years ago and it was a punch biopsy, and it showed atypical junctional melanocytic proliferation involving the margins. And then they did a re-excision, and it said dermal fibrosis. That was it, no residual lesion. So we had those reread, and they basically called it moderate to severely atypical melanocytic proliferation, which is basically the same sign out that this person got. So that's like what we're dealing with. And then they did a, just a re-excision and, and, and saw scar tissue. Now that is just not an adequate re-excision. Remember, adults do not make these atypical melanocytic lesions in their nail. It's melanoma until proven otherwise. And I was looking at him, and I think, I don't know, if we biopsy and it's, we don't see anything, then he might still have a melanoma. Like, what do you do in this case? So we said, we're going to cut everything out. Again, my spidey sense said, this is wrong. Cut it all out. So there's his intraoperative picture. Um, Nice view of the extensor tendon and the joint on the left. Hope you've eaten dinner. That's the on the pathology dish there. We'll ink this. Um, and I remember because the pathologist called me up and she said, you saved this guy's life. There was melanoma everywhere on this. Um, so, uh, you know, you have to sort of think through this process and know when you don't know, even if it's been a tricky case, otherwise biopsy. And just to scare you even more, this is, exists in the literature, and this was, you know, subungual melanoma showing basically nothing uh, clinically. So um, if you get, if you miss that one, I'll let you off the hook. All right. So where are we? We've got this pigmented lesion. You're faced with that patient. What do you do? You know, you, you might still have to biopsy the nail because thinking about all this stuff is only so good. So how do you make the decision? When do you follow it? When do you dismiss it? When do you refer it? When do you biopsy? Okay, these are the questions you'll be asking yourself. The same questions you ask about a pigmented lesion elsewhere, but in the nail it seems trickier because we're just not used to that. So, okay, automatic cases for biopsy. Hopefully everyone listening sees that brown background, irregular brown lines, nail splitting, that's gotta be a biopsy, right? You'd know you don't know what that is, okay. Then you get this case, sort of grayish, maybe multiple lesions, maybe you have a reason for it. You're like, okay, we'll just follow it clinically. Okay. And then there's this lesion. I keep coming back to him because this is a guy with multiple pigmented bands. The fellow I was working with at the time said nothing, you know, a good person who really knew the stuff. But no one you don't know. Okay. There's this gray zone, a big, fat, wide gray zone that people get biopsied in. And we're just not good at looking at these, even with magnification and making a diagnosis. So think about the following sort of key points. 
Okay, in general, younger people have a much lower risk of melanoma. So if it's prepubescent, I have seen several melanomas, but this is a weird referral bias. They're almost always benign. And if they're greater than 40, it is almost always malignant if it's one dark line. And in between those two, you really can't tell. Okay, so emblazon that on your brain. All right, if someone's light-skinned versus dark-skinned, light-skinned, single lesion, it's been said many times that it's melanoma until proven otherwise, especially if it looks like that left picture. And if it's darker-skinned patient, there's often multiple. The, the incidence of melanoma is the same regardless of your skin color, so that does not get someone with darker skin off the hook, but they're much more likely to have racial or ethnic pigment with darker skin than, the, than someone with lighter skin. In the same token, someone has multiple nails involved, whether it's ethnic or otherwise, you're generally thinking there's an underlying cause, it's your job to figure it out, versus one nail, which you're thinking this is a local process, a proliferative process. And where it's the ugly duckling. So here's that case again. Like, what if someone has multiple lesions, just like multiple nevi, and one is very different? That can be quite helpful. Going back to that lesion, if you take a narrow lesion such as that, similar process that's wider, they're actually both bad in this instance, but you're more worried about the wider one. Even though I showed you several pictures of narrow ones, it doesn't get you off the hook, but sort of general principles. The wider it is, the worse it is in general. And then dermoscopy is helpful. I mean, I already said use your dermatoscope, but sort of, right? Like in this instance, it doesn't look like much on the left. And you stick a dermatoscope on, it gives you more detail. All of a sudden you see a brown background and some lines there that you don't get. And here's an example. Dermoscopy shows, well, I think you're going to buy this anyway, but actually you see periungal pigment dermoscopy. You see a more of a brown background that you don't get clinically with this. So it gives you extra, extra information where to biopsy, um, how broad to biopsy, et cetera. Or this one where you're thinking it's, you know, not great anyway on the left and you stick a dermatoscope on and you say, yeah, well, that's terrible, right? I hope everyone looks at this and says, one, how did she let the pigmented nail grow so long? And then that this process is not good for her in all likelihood. Linear processes like on the left tend to be better. Of course, they can be melanoma. I showed you many of them versus smudged pigment. You see the thing on the right, please be concerned. Okay, here's just a more linear, but smudgy, irregular pigment on the left. That would be more concerning. And then finally, look for this triangle sign. When it's wider proximally, narrower distally, that means it's proliferating in the life of the nail. Be concerned about that. And anytime you see periungal pigment, look for it. There's a paper coming through that was just a reviewer for where the Hutchinson sign was more common on the hyponychium than the cuticle proximal nail fold, for what it's worth. I don't know if that's generalizable or not. All right, so at this point, maybe we've had dinner, maybe we've had a glass of wine. You're thinking, I have a headache. So what happens if you, pub if you Google, I have a headache? What does Google give you? <laughs> It'll be your last, right? They give you the worst case scenario about this. Um, I have too many personal anxiety-ridden experiences of this to share in the time we have allotted, but people will also do this with their nail. All right, so if you're worried, Get a second opinion, get a third opinion. Don't sit there and think, I know I don't know and not do anything. Don't be paralyzed by that. Don't wimp out, right? You see this lesion in your clinic and you think, everyone knows what to do with that lesion, right? We have a differential, we've got the histopathology in our head, we've got the staging criteria in our head, we know who we're gonna send it to, we can give them prognosis, same lesion, same diagnosis rather, different location, and you scratch your head and say it's probably fine. You mean you might not, but if you did, you'd be in good company. So I think we're hopefully beyond that. We're not gonna wimp out when we see that. This is sort of a little joke, but this is kind of what happens. Relax, David, it's just a small surgery. Don't panic if my name is not David, says the patient, and the doctor says, I know, I'm David. All right, when people wimp out, bad things happen. Right, these two cases are people who said at some point, was, should I have done something when I had a brown line in the nail? Yes, something should have been done when they had a brown line in the nail. Terrible when we miss these, okay? There's no excuse if they had a brown line. All right, Sutton's Law, go where the money is, right? If you're gonna biopsy these, go for the matrix. And I say that because I saw this case 
which had a bed biopsy of a matrix lesion. And then this person was followed inappropriately for a matrix malignancy when the biopsy was done in the wrong area until they developed radio or vertical growth phase disease. Terrible. All right. I'm going to show you a video of me doing a punch biopsy. Um, these can be done in clinic, but I really think it depends on how comfortable you are and how busy your clinics are. Uh, they're often better set up for a you know procedure time, but just to show you how efficiently they can be done. And of course, don't have enough time to talk about all these procedures, which I love to talk about. Um, but uh, just to show you, this is a punch biopsy, and this is your starter kit for nail surgery. I'm just doing a punch right through the nail plate. That's an advantage of doing the punch is you don't have to avulse the nail. Now I pause it there because about half the time the nail plate gets stuck in the punch. That goes in formalin jar number one. And then the matrix specimen will go in formalin jar number two. Um, but if they're connected, they can go in one jar. And you can see the little lesion there and gradle scissors. Pop that out. Shazam. There's your matrix punch biopsy. And I say it's like your starter kit for nail surgery because most of you with a little coaching can do this. Um, Julia Baltz and I have a paper that just came out this month called um, I think Nail Surgery, Six Essential Biopsy Techniques or something like that. Um, but if you PubMed me and her, you will see that. Uh, and that goes through the details of uh, punch biopsy. And then I have an article from 2006 that has the details of punch biopsy. Um, but once you start getting comfortable with that, you're going to want to do tangential excision or matrix shaves. And this shows, the, I showed this case before, he's a teenager and he had a previous biopsy a year before that was benign, red as benign, just junctional nevus, but it got wider and darker after that punch biopsy. So I'm seeing him, I'm re-biopsying. So first, if there's a suggestion of periungal pigment, that's biopsy number one, that goes in the jar. All right, we're going to reflect the proximal nail fold, get good exposure. Um, Incidentally, that's called a T-ring. You have to have a bloodless field or close to it to do these procedures. Otherwise, it's like repairing a watch in a jar of ink. Can't be done. This is called a partial proximal nail plate evulsion. Crowd goes wild. There's some oohs and ahs when we do these. Unless you're the mom's parent who's standing over my shoulder while I'm doing this. Okay. You can actually see the stellate scar in the middle. That's where they do the punch biopsy. That's sort of a weakness of punch biopsies, right? It's a longitudinal process and you're doing a round biopsy. But as I showed in the first case, it, it can work. This is an excisional tangential biopsy. Uh, we have a paper coming out in Durham Surge on proper coding for nail procedures. And the two I've shown, the proper coding is 11755. It's unanimous it's sort of an expert consensus it's there to the mom i'm pointing out the previous uh scar and now i will excise this tangentially uh just using the tip of the blade and then eventually the belly of the blade just to slide underneath that specimen anu if she's watching and jenny will love these because they get the whole thing the whole shebang they don't get a little smushed piece of hamburger they get this whole beautiful specimen and allows them to make a diagnosis, which can be tricky, which I'll talk about in just a second. So here I'm just using the blade to keep a plane that's gonna be less than a millimeter thick. Um, and we're doing a paper now on second intention healing of the nail. Uh, these tangential biopsies heal amazingly well, even if you basically excise almost the whole matrix. So the depth of it seems to matter. All right, I'm gonna carry on. You can, that's onychodermis underneath there. So I'm gonna move on for sake of time. All right, so let's back up. We did look beyond the nail, use your dermatoscope, know when you don't know. All right, now you're gonna, and then don't wimp out, it's 4A. So you haven't wimped out. Now you have this specimen. You have to send it to someone who knows what the hell they're looking at. So you see on the right, our own Anu, who's read all of my slides for as long as I've been with AP Derm and does an outstanding job. So we are lucky to have her. And the people who I really learn nails with are uh, Leslie Robinson Boston and Vlas Talang, and they're outstanding as well and good colleagues. And Adam Rubin, who's at Penn is on the left. Adam's dropped like 50 pounds since then. He looks like a different human now. Um, 
it's really important because they have the tough job. You think the pictures I showed was tough. Okay, look at those cases in the top right. All of those are melanoma, okay? When they looked at the original initial biopsies of those, 50% of them were subtle findings. And in some of them, it was only these scattered atypical melanocytes with the hypochromatic nuclei. That was the key finding. It wasn't like um, nested, uh, you know, upward growth, it was subtle findings. And some of that is because people weren't doing great biopsies. They're doing little punches of larger lesions. But some of it is that dermatopathology in these lesions is hard. So uh, be kind to your dermatopathologist and give them nice big specimens. All right, last teaching point, what I'll finish with is don't amputate unless you have to. All right, we already said, what's the most common digits? Thumb, then big toe. So let's just take the thumb. Anyone listening now, give a melanoma in situ in the thumb, you have the option of having an amputation or not. Of course, you don't want to have an amputation. You just want to have, you know, you want to have your survival benefit be the same. And here's a meta-analysis from the JAD two years ago. Uh, no difference in terms of local recurrence rate. Um, this should be the standard of care. During my career, I think I've seen this evolve. Over the first five or 10 years of my career, if you went to certain cancer centers, you got a uh, disarticulation even for insight to melanoma. Uh, my first foray trying to explain this away, you wrote a paper on this back in 2010. We have a collection of 29 patients and, we're, and we have no recurrences, no disease spread. And we're just waiting until we have a minimum of five-year follow-up, which is actually now, um, which will be the best paper on this topic because all the ones are, are fraught with follow-up that's too short. And we actually did a quality of life study on some of these patients and showed that there's no difference in quality of life once they're healed versus controlled. So when patients are worried about these bigger surgeries, we've actually studied the quality of life. It's, um, it's great in terms of psychological um, and physical activities. And so this is a softball picture. And this is the last thing I'm going to finish with uh, from, I think, PC, Providence College. And a dermatologist's daughter actually played on the team with her. And from a practice, this dermatologist sent me a picture. This is a dermatologist who sends me nothing, but she sent me this picture, which I'm grateful for. Um, and I said, send her in. It was on her fifth finger, so not the thumb. She's a pitcher, dominant hand, problem. And it was a melanoma site too. And this just shows a condensed version. Let me see how long this video is of this excision. And I'll try to sort of summarize while I talk because I have less than five minutes to go. Um, but this is what the digit sparing, conservative, non-amputative, on block, these are all synonyms, uh, surgery looks like. And it's the entire nail apparatus. So nail bed, nail plate, nail matrix, nail folds, um, excised in toto, on block. And the plane of dissection is going to be the dorsal distal phalanx, and that will um, basically be lifted off of the periosteum of the ungual process because the periosteum of the ungual process is very tenaciously actually adherent to the onychodermis. And then over the waist of the phalanx, usually with periosteum, and then at the base of the phalanx, you transition to where the extensor tendon inserts onto the distal phalanx and runs over the joint down the base of the distal phalanx, and so you're right on top of the extensor tendon. So right, all sorts of room for problem here. And to make things more complicated, the, diff, the distance between the apical matrix and the um, extensor tendon is one millimeter on average. So you have to be right on the tendon. And so there are a lot of tricks to doing this. And again, this is not a full-on procedure talk. This is a well, Ananikia talk, but it's good to see what your patients are going to go through. So tips down here. I don't think, you know, it's weird. You do these and they represent one point in time. And then you realize I do it a little diff differently now. This is a fine way to do it though. So uh, our outcomes are all based on these, uh, this technique here now. Um, so now I'm, I'm basically just finding my plane again above the bone. And now I'm looking, I'm going to see the insertion of the extensor tendon. I'm showing someone else that's where the tendon is. We get the, the uh, light right behind you. Again, it's very easy to transect your tissue plane, which is a big no-no here. And then we'll complete the excision just over the tendon. You can see the longitudinal fibers of the tendon there. 
And uh, again, light uh, loops uh, for magnification and uh, bloodless field and perfect anesthesia are sort of absolute prerequisites for this. This is like you put your big boy pants on for this one. Um, and I still think that of all the things I do, all the interpolated flaps and everything else, this is actually the trickiest procedure I do as a dermatologic surgeon. Uh, it's also probably the most important surgery I do. Uh, so anyway, that, this just shows that that's like the, the money shot there. Like when you catch the big tuna, you hold it up and that's that. So that's her long-term follow-up. These are our teaching points. I think we covered all of them. Hopefully we raised some questions, answered some questions. And I don't know if we have time for Q&A and all that, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions here. So let me get back to there and stop my share. All right. That was an amazing talk. I mean, so much, so much to learn from. Um, Heather or Mark, do you want to um, let the guests know how they can um, raise their hands for questions? Yep, uh, we actually have one already, but if you are if you're, want to ask a question at the bottom, you just click the uh, raise hand button and I will open up your, your line to speak. So first we have um, Helena. Hi, Dr. Jelinek. It's Helena Hi. Kuhn. Thank you for this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I know I, I don't know anything apparently about nails and I send you a lot, but my question is if we are monitoring melanonychia, do you have a recommendation for what interval, you know, what type of change we should be looking for? Mm -hmm. um, if you have any guidance on that. Yeah. Thank you. So um, yeah, usually if I'm monitoring it, I like to see it back like one life if it's a fingernail, one life of the nail later, and the average adult, it's like three or four months for them to have replaced a nail. And I really think that dermoscopy for follow-up and uh, head like side by side has changed my practice the most in terms of this follow-up. Great. So yeah, make sure you okay. can do that. And for the toenail, it's harder because, you know, the big toe it's like a year and a half to grow out yeah. the big toe and you wouldn't want to watch yeah. that. So I probably wouldn't go beyond six months on a toe. Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. And uh, next we have Dr. Muse. Hi, great talk. Thank Can you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, t um, uh, my question is about time frame. So like those lesions that look very similar and you can't really tell if one's been around for years and years and hasn't changed and one is new, would that be helpful information for you? Yeah, so new is always helpful, right? New is like one of those things you have to almost assume it's growing. Chronic doesn't help me. You know, I've seen too many that, you know, I think we all appreciate that some of these tumors are very slow growing until they're not. And so the fact that it's there and someone else maybe has said it's fine in the patient, I don't trust patients on this, but doesn't help me that much. And I think the trickiest part, Peter, is in kids. This, it really is tricky. We could do a whole hour on pediatric melanomachia. Um, we have a quick plug. You should all join the Council for Nail Disorders. Um, we have journal clubs virtually, it's great. And we had an article couple months ago on pediatric melanonychia. I think Adam Rubin and I just argued for 30 minutes about this article. I mean, we could go on. It's so hard. So following them, I do sometimes follow pediatric melanonychia much more than adult melanonychia. Um, but I guess just to go back to your question, if it is stable or historically stable, it, I try to take it at that point in time based on what I know and what I don't know. All right, that's all the questions I have right now. Well, Nat, I just want to thank you. That was just an amazing talk. Uh, I, I don't know about others, but I realized at the end of your talk how little I know. And um, uh, I hope you don't mind being uh, overwhelmed with consults with all of us who don't, don't uh, we suddenly realize we don't know a lot. 
Uh, <laughs> well, hopefully you can give us more tips on doing our own biopsies so we all become comfortable with that uh, over the, uh, across the practice. Uh, it also reminds me of, uh, you know, how far this practice has come and it really makes me proud. Uh, I can't believe I started as a solo practice and mm -hmm. I really wanted a group practice just for this reason. So I could be supported by great colleagues like you because uh, uh, I always have the philosophy, whoever does the job best uh, gets the job. And it's just great to have such a uh, depth of expertise within our practice. And, and you really epitomize that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sam.